Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. How many of you have ever found yourself in the valley of what we call despair or despondency? You know, we have so many people today that are facing various valleys and, you know, God intended for us to be on the mountain. You know, David said, yea, though I walk through that valley of the shadow of death, and I will fear no evil. Did you know that in Israel there is really a valley called the valley of the shadow of of death. And David was right when he said, I will walk through that valley. I didn't come to stay. You know, most people think, well, I'd like to live in the valley surrounded by mountains. But shouldn't we all be like Caleb who said, God, give me this mountain. Give me the mountain. That's the challenge. You know, a lot of great things were done on mountains. Think about it. The ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. Uh, we know that uh, Moses received the law of God on the mountain. We know that he was privileged to look into the great promised land on Mount Pisgah. Think about it. Abraham offered his son, did he not? On the mountain, Mount Moriah. Jesus preached his famous sermon on the mountain outside of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives. We know that that was where Christ retreated prior to his crucifixion. Paul preached his sermon on Mars Hill. We could go on and on. There is a litany of illustrations in the Bible about mountains, and God doesn't want us in the valley. He wants us on top of the mountain. When was your last mountaintop experience? Maybe you hadn't been able to experience it because you've been in the valley too long. Well, we want to talk this morning about how do we get out of this valley of despair. And we want to call, first of all, this morning on my good friend, Brother Barry Haynes, uh, from over at Hope, Arkansas. And Barry, talk to us a little bit about this valley of despair. You know, when we think about getting through the valley of despair, we have to first have to realize where we are. John Dewey once said, a problem uh, well put is half solved. And if we want to get through something, we first have to recognize where we are at. And when we are facing despair, when we're in despondency, we need to admit it. Uh, we need to realize where we're at. Sometimes we, we don't want to admit things, but you know, ignorance and denial, they're not solutions. They're just evasions. They're just delays. And so there are times when we need to recognize. Now, why don't we do that? Well, for some, it's because maybe they don't want people to know. They're embarrassed. They think they've it's a bad thing. They want to hide their problems. But you know, true courage isn't, uh, isn't not having fear. It's dealing with fear. And having courage and recognizing when you are struggling with things, that's, it's not denying that it's there, but uh, realizing where you're at. Sometimes we don't want people to know, but we need to understand that, that God is there for us. And even in our times of weakness, as Paul would talk about with his thorn in the flesh, we can find our greatest strengths. Uh, we need to realize that sometimes being in the valley of despair isn't, isn't unusual. Uh, you know, in our country today, there are 19 million people who are described themselves as depressed. That's one in 10 Americans, you know. It's like the guy who went to a doctor's office and says, well, I never get sick. And the doctor said, well, I need to run a lot of tests on He said, why not? I'm not sick. He goes, because that's unusual. If you're not sick, something's wrong. And in the same way, if you don't find yourself at times when you're suffering with that, it's because maybe you're not recognizing the state that you're in. But what we need to realize is when we find ourselves in the valley of despair, we're not in bad company. Some people make the mistake of thinking, if I'm, if I'm struggling with depression, it makes me ungodly. But that's just not the case. There were some great godly men who suffered times. We think about Elijah when he, as we'll talk about today, Elijah, when he was dealing with his, his, his struggles. We think about Moses, we think about David, you can't help but read the Psalms and see David in the times when he struggled against things. Uh, 
consider uh, consider Jesus himself in the garden. What did he say in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 27? He said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. He said he was grieved and distressed in what he was going through. Grief and those things will come. We need to recognize when they're there so we can deal with them and move to a better place. Back to you, Dan. Well, thank you so much, Barry. We appreciate your good words this morning that serve to help us get out of that valley uh, of despair. You know, we all find ourselves in despair at times. I saw a bumper sticker the other day on the back of a car. It said, Jesus made us sisters, but Prozac made us friends. You know, and maybe that's kind of the ways sometimes people look at it in life. We have to admit the problem, first of all, but then we have to analyze the problem. And uh, But the Perry Cowan is going to help us analyze that problem. And uh, how do we do that, Perry? Just how do we do it? Well, let's take a look at uh, what the scriptures tell us since we're going to give you the Bible. Why? Am I depressed? That's something that we all need to answer if we go through uh, and find ourselves in the valley of distress. Even when things seem to be going well, sometimes we feel depressed. Why? Brother Barry mentioned a couple of examples in the Old Testament. Let's take a look at one of them. His name is Elijah. And we're going to refer to, to 1 Kings chapter 19 and listen to what is recorded about Elijah. It says, Ahab, uh, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with his sword. This is no small thing. It was a major accomplishment, uh, yet we find that he became depressed. Now, what he had done had, was to destroy all the prophets that uh, were serving uh, Ahab and Jezebel in their kingdom. Uh, and that, she wasn't very happy about it and ordered him to be killed. Well, oftentimes when people get depressed, they, they want to withdraw. They want to be alone, uh, away from people. Let's look again at Elijah a little further down in that passage. And he was afraid, and he got up and ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he, uh, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked for himself to die. And he said, That's enough. I've had enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then he lay down and fell asleep under a broom tree and intended to die there because of his depression, his depressed state. Now, we get depressed. We don't want to do things. We don't want to smile when we don't feel like smiling. We don't want to laugh when we don't feel like laughing. We don't want to sing when we don't feel like singing. We, we just don't want to do anything. And it deepens our depression. So I suggest that uh, oftentimes this comes about because we focus on our problems instead of praying to our God and turning it over to Him. Dan? Well, Perry, I think that is the answer. The Bible says that we're to cast our cares on Him, for He cares for us, and that's our Lord, and He does. I'm uh, so thankful this morning that uh, Brother Kerry Clark is here, and uh, he's going to share with us some additional things about this despair that we often find ourselves in. So, uh, Kerry, if you will, talk to us again a little further about this despair or depression. I really believe there are three different causes. Uh, would you share those with us? Well, Dan, I'd be glad to share those with you. If we look into the Word of God, and I want us to do that, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, I believe Paul sums up the struggles of life without Jesus Christ. And he says in Romans 7 in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
And then, of course, he gives us that great statement in verse number 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. See, there's the answer, Jesus Christ our Lord. But let's think about some of the causes. You know, when you think about causes, it may be a physical cause. Uh, it may be that you've done something and, and uh, it's caused some physical discomfort. You're like the guy that said, he broke his arm in three places, and the guy said, what'd you do? And he said, I didn't go back to those places. And I think sometimes when we find ourselves in the valley of despair, we need to stay out of that place and not go back. And so sometimes it's a physical cause. It may be work. It may be carrying that work home with us. It may be as a housewife, you've got children, whatever it is. And then secondly, Dan, there are no doubt there are chemical imbalances that people have. And uh, they need to reach out to the medical field to get those resolved. But we also understand there are emotional things that lead to these depressions that we have in our life. And I believe that if we look into the Word of God, we will find the answer to those causes. You know, Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. See, we've got to stop looking at the moment and look beyond the moment as Jesus did in Hebrews 12 and verse number 1. He looked beyond the cross and saw the joy. And so some of those causes of depression might be divorce. It might be death. It might be disaster. Whatever it is, friends, I, I believe that if we'll go to the Word of God, that the Word of God will help us get through each and every one of those moments. And in Hebrews 12, in verse number 15, we've got to look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Don't let that bitterness be a part of your life. Carrie, thank you for helping us understand that. You know, if we really understood depression and despair and how that really happens, then perhaps we could come to grips and regain our own equilibrium. Well, that's exactly what Elijah did, did he not? He attacked the problem itself. He didn't just say, I'm gonna wring my hands in despair and this is terrible thing, woe me. You know what God's saying to you? Get off the pity pot and start thinking about other people instead of yourself and attack that problem. And Brother Chris Grote is going to tell us how to do that. We do spend a lot of our life vacillating between being pumped up and being deflated. Sometimes we're fearless, other times we're timid, sometimes we're encouraged, sometimes we're discouraged. And I think we can be so discouraged and so uh, frightened by a situation that we can be driven into a, a depression to the point where we wish God would just take our life. And that's, that's what happened to Elijah. Uh, but you'll see after he fell asleep under that broom tree out there in the wilderness, an angel came and touched him and offered him food and water. Not only did it once, did it twice. And, and then wanted him to come and stand up on a mountain and give him a vision. Gave him a vision of a strong wind and then, uh, and then fire and then an earthquake. And... Uh, God said uh, he wasn't in any of those, but a still small voice. As for we chew on that for a little while, we, we get the idea that God is not only limited to being present in those things, but he can be present when there's no wind and when there's no fire and when there's no earthquake. And, and Elijah had seen God's mighty power on Mount Carmel. He had seen all of that. He wasn't seeing it now. And in the the looming threat of, of Jezebel to kill him, uh, he had just freaked out and he forgot. In spite of, of all that God had done before, he forgot God's power and his presence and he fled. And so that's the problem with uh, depression is we can't keep, um, can't keep our eyes focused on God. And that's what happened to him. And the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7 that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm convinced Paul wrote that to Timothy who at that time had been timid because of Paul's persecutions. We're reminded of what Psalm 121 says. David says, I'm going to lift up my eyes to the hill. Where does my help come from? Well, my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And in that chapter and in that Psalm, God will not sleep. He'll always be our shelter. 
Sun and moon will not strike us. Protection will be from now on out, coming and going, never to go away. Depressed people usually look down. God's Word says let's look up and keep our eyes focused on God. We quit thinking about all of our problems and all of our burdens and, and bring God back into the picture. And that's what happened. Slowly but surely, God brought Elijah back. Back to you, Dan. And we're so thankful, Chris, that God did bring him back. And we're thankful to you for your good words this morning. You know, when I think about the good Lord, I'm reminded that the joy that he gives me, no man can take from me. Someone gave a little acrostic for joy the other day. It said the J represents Jesus, the O represents others, and the Y represents yourself. And you know, if we put it in perspective, we understand that the joy of the Lord really is our strength. And he is the one who enables us to find that joy once again. And uh, Brother Jerry Munholland is uh, going to talk to us further uh, actually about this despair and how to overcome it. Jerry? Thank you, Dan. Now, as we talk about being in despair, and Brother Chris has said, uh, Elijah, as he had looked down, and because he was uh, in despair, because he had a, had a great victory in 1 Kings chapter 18, he, he because of that, uh, his life was put in danger, and he went into discouragement and despair, and he was, uh, oh, woe is me type of attitude. And as Brother Chris had said, Elijah, you need to look up instead of looking down. And we continue with that. Not only did he look down, they needed to look up, but he needed to look around. Look at uh, chapter 19 of 1 Kings and verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Uh, he said you need to look around. You need to go to Damascus because there are people there who need you. There were a, a couple of kings there, and there was a, a prophet there, and they needed uh, Elijah to be there and, and his help and his anointing and his encouragement. And sometimes it is whenever we look down upon ourselves in despair, we don't look up and we don't look around. And so what it is that we can do that when we look around? Well, I think we could look around and, and give someone a visit, right? Is there someone who, who needs encouragement, needs a visit that we can do? Uh, maybe you can't go and visit them, but maybe you could uh, go give them a call. Use your telephone. I once knew the lady who was good at calling others. It was said of her that she had a telephone and she knew how to use it. Yeah, let's, let's give someone a call. Make a visit, make a call. Maybe it is that you could send a card. We don't send cards very much with our technology and everything. On Facebook, we just like things or, or we make a comment. But, you know, to receive a card from someone in the mail is such an encouragement to let them know that you are thinking of them and, and encouraging them. Pray for one another is also something that we can do with one another. Uh, there are those who need our prayers, who, who need time spent, our name lifted up. So... When we're discouraged and looking down, remember to look up to our Lord God, trust in Him, and look around. What can we do to encourage others? Pray. I'm sure a door of opportunity will be given there. Now back to you, Dan. You know, God always opens doors that are closed, Jerry, and you're right. And maybe have an opportunity right now to think about someone who's going through some problem or dilemma in their life, some despair, and they need your help. I call it despair repair. <laughs> and you know what? We ought to be repairing the despair that others have and what we have ourselves. And uh, we're going to ask Buddy Ray right now to, to tell us how to go about repairing that despair. Buddy? Okay. Thank you, Dan. And certainly we need each one of us to look at ourselves as we begin this morning. I want you to think about how easy it becomes sometimes for us to look at others to see the faults in them and to see the repairs that they need to make, but so often we don't look at our own selves and examine ourselves and determine what we need to fix in our life. This is so important because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, the Apostle Paul says that each one of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that I may receive those things done in the body according to what I have done, whether they be good or bad. 
And because I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I need to do what the Apostle Paul told the Philippians to do in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. I need to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it is oh so important that I work on myself, that I do those things I need to do to bring myself closer to God and to serve Him faithfully. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says these words. He said, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see, I must look at myself. I must walk in the light as he is in the light, and truly, I must each and every day make the needed repairs to my life that I need to make in order to have that home in heaven. I want you to think about this this morning also. Who are you measuring yourself against, or what are you measuring yourself against? I don't need to look at others and take that old common thought and that ground of, well, I'm better than he is, I'm better than she is, look at what she does or he does, but I need to stop and measure myself against the only standard that counts. That is the Word of God. I need to look into God's Word. I need to see the standard that is set for me. I need to see the commandments that I need to follow. If I'm not doing that, I need to quickly make the needed repairs, and I need to put my body in a way that I can discipline myself to follow God and to truly keep His commandments. This morning, as Dan mentioned earlier, are you repairing your despair? Are you preparing yourself to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Well, buddy, thank you so much. Now, we're going to go to our last panelist here, not the least, but uh, the last. <laughs> and uh, actually, Brother Rocky Whiteley. Uh, Rocky, I want you to, if you will, to kind of sum up maybe a little bit here and, and also give us some examples of people that were able to conquer their despair and repair it and move on with their lives, and life became better for them. And if we can see those examples, then we can surely know that it can happen in our lives as well. Thank you, Dan, and it's good to be with all of you. I'm sure that you've heard this expression, attitude determines altitude. And while God didn't invent those words, there's no question that he invented that idea and reveals it to us in the scripture. I think particularly of the story of Joseph that is told in the book of Genesis. Almost a third of the book of Genesis is about the story of Joseph. And we look at his life and how many things he could have been depressed about from his brother's jealousy of him, uh, from their throwing him into a pit with intent to murder, uh, from them selling him into slavery, him ending up in Potiphar's house uh, as he is accused of, falsely accused of rape and ends up in an Egyptian prison. At any point in, this, uh, in his life, he could have lost hope. But what we find out is that God was working through Joseph and blessed him and raised him up where he became second only to Pharaoh uh, in Egypt. And when he met with his brothers after the death of, uh, after the death of their father, he said, you intended to harm me but God intended it for good. We see other stories. We see the story of David uh, as King Saul pursued him and tried to kill him. This is even after God had selected him to be the second king of, of Israel. And David, we read in the Psalms about uh, the, the, the struggles that he had and we would say depression that, that he might have suffered as well. Psalm 6, Psalm 10, how about maybe Psalm 22? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so, so far from me, so far from my cries of anguish? But you know, those words are not only the words of David, they're the words of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And what they had was what is called hope. And for any depressed person, what they need most of all is hope. God delivered David and David knew that. God delivered Jesus by raising him from the dead. God will deliver you. You must hope in him. Dan? 
And Rocky, God is the great deliverer. He is. And he helps us through any crisis that we may fight in this life. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Thank you for being a supporter of Give Me the Bible. And we hope that uh, you'll continue to invite your friends to join you each week at the same time. I'm Dan Manuel. I've been your host here today on this telecast. And we hope that you'll join us next week at this same time for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing the sweetest song of all.